just to start off, who you are, what you're up to, and why are you here on this panel? Sure, thank you, Renee. Um, my name is Jeff. I'm the founder of Green Light Essentials. It's a company dedicated to helping the payment professionals um, better understand movie data and bring big data and analytics to the film industry. Um, we have software that requires either programming or mathematics background to use, which we can help entertainment professionals to understand what elements of the movie would help pull in audience, or what elements of the movie would help audience play. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much what we do. And this panel, I think, is a perfect fit for us because that's what we do. <laughs> Uh, hey, I'm Jay. Uh, I run a company called Smoke Bomb Entertainment. It's here in Toronto. Um, we make stuff. We make content for sort of all platforms, um, from television to features to, to YouTube. I think the relevant talking points or our history that brings me to this panel is uh, social audience engagement is a big part of how we not only um, market uh, programming but develop programming. Um, we did a show last year, a YouTube scripted series called Carmilla, that we used a lot of audience mapping with, and we're at about 30 million views on that worldwide. And now we're taking the approach to that and putting it to features, actually, um, with a feature we have called Darken, where that will actually launch with a uh, highly serialized, multi-episodic uh, YouTube series that will tell the origin of the feature and we'll use audience engagement strategies to build towards the, the release of the, of the feature itself. Hi, my name is Yvette Vargas. Uh, I'm uh, from New York, uh, but I live in LA. And I am the CEO uh, and co-founder of a company called Digital Rain in LA. It's a multi-platform uh, storytelling content creation production company. And at the company, for myself, I'm, a, I'm the writer, director, producer, and, uh, and a multi-platform content creator. And basically what, what that means, and very much echoing uh, Jay, is that basically we tell stories across multiple platforms, one franchise at a time. One of the uh, successes that we've had of late was a digital series called Dark Prophet which actually never even premiered in the digital space. We ended up premiering at Sundance in uh, 2014. So it was a digital series uh, that, that actually was very much, it could have premiered on, on, on television. Um, you know, we definitely made it to the level of uh, television quality, but it ended up premiering at, at Sundance, and I was in talks already with DirecTV. So based on that buzz from Sundance, all 11 episodes actually ended up um, uh, premiering or, or just airing on a direct TV channel. And then uh, from there, the, the, the series was nominated for two Emmys in the interactive category. Last year, lost the Game of Thrones, but I can live with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's HBO, they win everything. Um, so, but with that, I developed this model where um, I'm able to actually take any, any project for our clients where it's a lot of television series content as well as comic books and, and, and features and live experiences and gaming and apps um, and run it through this model where we're growing audience, monetizing, there's lots of built-in monetization strategies with every single platform and, and, and medium um, and hopefully you know, the, the, the content itself is, is, is of quality and also gaining critical acclaim because that's for us that's, that's definitely the winning um, uh, just, just basically how the metrics of how you reach success in this digital storytelling age in the 21st century. It's, it's about audience building, monetizing, and critical acclaim. So uh, what I'm going to be speaking about today is literally that model that we use in the creative process as well as testing every medium and platform along the way and that's to grow the franchise. Okay. Uh, okay. Good intro. Uh, my name is Gary Faber. Um, I run ERM Research, and we are a market research firm. And we specialize in, well, film um, for the most part, but we do a lot of live theater and a lot of television work as well. And our job basically is to work with filmmakers and distributors and um, even exhibition on understanding audiences and how to better deliver content for them and how to make films maybe better. We do a lot of research screenings that a lot of you may have been a part of or seen me there at them where we'll show early cuts of movies to audiences and we'll get the feedback on how to make it better. Um, and then we'll also go ahead and work with them on how to actually market the film and better kind of tweak their message to reach out to the public. So 
um, a lot of traditional methodologies um, incorporated with a lot of new um, cutting edge methodologies. And by the way, I am from New York and I still live in New York. <laughs> <laughs> I, my name is Michael Dowell. I do not live in New York nor Los Angeles, nor am I from either of those places. Um, I live and work in New Orleans, Louisiana, where I'm part of a film production company uh, and another sister company of it, Court 13 and Field Office Films. We, um, we produce Beasts of the Southern Wild, and we uh, have since been involved in producing the Vimeo on demand cycle of um, high maintenance, if people are familiar with that series. And then, um, you know, we've also produced. Um, some, you know, small documentaries that we put to Sundance. Uh, I come at this angle, or this sort of topic, because I had a fellowship at a thing called uh, the Cinema Research Institute, um, which is a project of NYU, um, where for a year we studied how you can use the grassroots organizing tactics of um, the Obama campaigns of, excuse me, President Obama campaign of uh, 2008 and 2012 um, how you can use those in the uh, distribution of films. And a lot of that had to do with uh, data and proper management of data. So um, that's sort of my way in here. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Um, that research was fascinating, actually. It was, I was really pleased to be able to get a hold of that. Um, so in terms of what audiences want, I mean, we the title of the session is How to Unveil the Monster, and, and that came from some additional research where we were looking at that within the story arc, within the actual trajectory, there is a scientific method of understanding at what point does an audience react to different kinds of stimuli or different kinds of impacts within the story. Um, so there are there's research out there that claims that this is totally scientific, that you can literally time the time to unveil the monster. And so the answer, the, the question that I want to ask the panel um, is, do, do audiences know what they want? And I'm going to leave that open, whoever feels that that resonates with you. Do audiences know what they want? I can say for certain that audiences know what they don't want. Um, that is very clear, um, that they have no idea what they don't want. Um, but they, they know what they don't want. As far as knowing what they want, um, I think there is an interesting idea that I'm going to probably say no for the most part. That is our job as um, content creators to give them something that maybe they didn't know that they want. You mentioned Game of Thrones. That's a great example. If I pitched any of you on that property, everybody would say, there's no way I'm ever going to watch that show. Um, probably Walking Dead, the same thing. People are watching zombies that are like, why would anybody watch a zombie show? That isn't right. I know that's all everything watch. Everybody yeah, watches. so I think there's a point there that they, they don't know, and it's our job to show them that they want it. But within all of the stories, there's elements that audiences do want. Um, these shows are dressed up as packages of emotions that audiences really want, or smart characters that audiences want to watch. Um, so that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, I use the analogy, uh, a very specific, very specific small analogy, but I think about, I saw The Flash last year. I love that film. I don't even know how I, the trailer got me. That's what got me in there. And I went and then tried to tell a lot of people about it. And I used the very specific example of my ultimate Frisbee co ed team, who are not. It's a very specific example. It's a very specific example, but they're sort of, they're not artists in a sense. And, and I'm sort of, have you guys seen Whiplash, like standing around after a game? And I was like, oh, what's it about? They say, well, it's about a drummer, and he's trying to make it in the school. And everyone's just like, no, nah, not for me, not for me. And, then, actually, I, I kept on it, and people came back over the next couple of weeks and said, I saw it, some of that was like, I saw it twice. They were like, that was amazing. And so to go and say an audience, I guess it's that thing of, like, saying a population. A, a population may have an opinion, but to an individual, and maybe that'll bring us to the Netflix recommends topic, like, to an individual, you know what you sort of think, you know, you have some senses, but I think the job is just to explore, right? That's, that's the new digital revolution, is the exploration. I, I kind of come at it, well, I, I agree that people absolutely know what they don't want and what they don't like. Um, but uh, when people are searching for content, they usually go to genres that they like and themes that they like, past, past content that they've seen that has resonated. They're, they're looking for, they're looking to, it's kind of, it's kind of like a, you know, someone, someone who's, who's hooked on anything. They want to. They want to basically duplicate 
that that experience that they, that they get from something that they actually love and connect with and they're really passionate about. So, so people are searching for things that they that have moved them in the past. So that absolutely speaks to some data, knowing that, and there are some popular themes and some popular genres. So you know, I tend to think that there there are a good amount of people that know what they're looking for. They may not be able to know specifically what the story is, or this new character that comes along and blows everybody away, or or you know, there's just some some new kind of structure in a story that kind of you know just makes people think higher in terms of storytelling. Um, so I'm kind of not necessarily in the middle because I definitely do agree that not uh, most people know what they well they, they know what they don't what they don't like, but they're definitely searching for things that they've loved before. And and there's a tremendous amount of other things that they've never seen before. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. And then and, it's and like, that's, oh, yeah. I've never seen this before. Which is fantastic. And that's as creator, that's absolutely what we're always trying to create. It's like, wow, what is that thing that we haven't seen before that can really move the generation and can, can say something just with visuals and so few words and everything else. So um, I think there's a lot to be said for knowing that people are smarter or the audience is smarter than, uh, than they've been given credit for in the past and that they are searching for something that moves them. I think that has come up with high maintenance. I mean, I would imagine that, especially from a webisode perspective, you know, how would the audience have discovered it and engaged with it? Well, it's, yeah, it's funny. As I was, as, as I was listening, oh. The data the data is wrong. There's your monster, guys. There's your monster. <laughs> um I was thinking about it that um it's it's these days from coming at it from kind of an independent um film space or area, it's like I, I think that there's a high premium because a lot of the times where you're launching your film or in a space when I think about the films that we've made, it's you're launching them in a space where it's sort of um, predisposed to anybody kind of coming in, and then there being a like festivals, for example, and then there being a very high premium on word word of mouth or external validators, people who say, um, you know, I swear you have to see Whiplash. I really, you know, and it, it's not a friend talking to their ultimate frisbee team. It's somebody, you know, in a publication. There's a high because there's such a glut of production. I feel like there's a higher premium. On all the people in the mass internet saying, "No, we swear this thing out in Sundance is the thing you have to see." No, and and it's trickier when there is no set launching point like that. So the reason that people knew to watch the second season of High Maintenance is because all of the first episodes were available online for free. So there was no in in, in so in a vacuum of not having that kind of space to like a festival, like an actual physical space. And you're just dealing with something prior, like the the vast internet. Then you then I think having free content, I guess is what I'm saying, to build up a, a following and to build up information, um, people who you know to build up a fan base, to build up an email listserv, is is crucial. Um, and then there's a whole other discussion as to whether or not that those people, those fans of that first free season, um, you know, pr uh, transferred over and watched the second season. But that's more of a conversation about kind of paywalls and you know, SVOD and everything like that. Well, I think this also leads into like what the actual data is and I, I, I feel like Jack's ready to, to discuss this. Um, yeah, what, are, what is the data? What's out there? Yeah, I think um, what the panel just said was correct. You know, people know what they don't want, but um, when you ask them specifically what they do want, you don't get a certain answer. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of it, I think, is the audiences, they're not aware of what they want. Um, consciously speaking, like, there is a trend, there is a pattern behind it, they're just not aware of it. But data, on the other hand, uh, can show what the trend is, what, what pattern or combination of these patterns are that are drawing audiences, while they themselves may not even be aware of. That's, uh, that's the beauty of data analytics, and you're looking at it from a different perspective, I guess, you know, asking people, what do you want? Yeah. But what actual data is there? I mean, what is it that is floating around on the internet what is being collected about us, about us as an audience? What is it being collected about our habits? Where is it being collected? Um, you know, like what's out there? What's out there about each of us? Um, everything. everything. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yeah. Uh, when you go online, you're being traced mostly by mm -hmm. cookies and 
don't want to get too technical, but your actions online, what you watch, what you what questions you go on and stop and face. Um, and I don't think there's any way to really stop that nowadays. Um, some way it's probably possible to apply some things you want, things you like, but in some ways it maybe doesn't go from policy. Mm -hmm. My view on that. I mean, as an example, the way we approach now, especially with digital, like the serialized, highly scripted YouTube series, if you have a sense of what we want to do, we we use a non-technical process of drawing Venn diagrams, um, but we do that social, the social hashtag scrapes, really, and the thinking being, let's make a show for a very specific audience. Um, I even mentally sort of say, let's make a show for 2,000 people, because within the vast sea of the multi-billion viewer uh, universe of the internets, 2,000 people being that specific actually is quite a few. But trying to go and get a bunch of people is actually really broad. And I, I use an example. We made a series, I think sort of mistakenly, called Mislabeled about fashion. And the problem was is the show was about fashion. And, and going out into the world of the internet and even trying to research and find out and learn about that audience is next to impossible because that's so vast. It's like doing an office workplace comedy. Well, really now, who is that for? It's very hard. We should have done a show about yellow high heel shoes. And, but, I'm, but I'm serious about that, right? Like, okay, so I can go into the internet and I can go into the data and I can go and scrape conversations, comments, hashtags, uploads, likes, and understand very specifically there is 2,000 people, which is actually going to be tens of millions of people who have an interest in shoes, in high-end shoes. I say yellow because that's even more specific. So how we approach the data scrape um, using our, our thing is we go and we find, okay, there's an audience talking, sharing, uploading, liking high-end shoes. Um, of all the colors out right now, what is the color that is maybe on trend within the conversation of fashion? Um, there, you know, you go and you look at foot fetishes, Seriously, like you, you go and understand that audience, you start to put those Venn diagrams together and you come up with this really specific data point audience gap that you can go and make a show for. Yeah. Um, well, for, you know, for myself and, and also at our company, because we're, it's, a creative, it's a creative company, so we're always coming from the point of story first and the characters and the story world. And, and I mean, that, that's, we live, we live and breathe and die by, by the story, but um, you know, within that, and and looking at and, and having this vast amount of data that is available to every you know every creator, producer, um, you know, you know, storyteller, what what have you, uh, you know, even in the creative process, if the characters are a certain age, we're looking at what is what does this average? Let's just still just sit there, you know, twenty some odd, some odd. Uh, you know, female living in New York, you know, 20 some odd years old, works at a fashion magazine. Um, she wears yellow, yellow, yellow high heels. She has a fetish. She has a fetish, in fact. So um, I'm not 20 something. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, but definitely, um, there's so much information available online in terms of who is this character in the virtual world. So to make my character on the page three dimensional. It's so easy to actually pull all this data and create this three-dimensional character and actually put them in a place where they're, you know, what what kind of um, you know uh, digital uh, devices do they have? What are their habits? It's so easy to actually find that information and craft this very live 3D 20-year-old some something. This persona. Yes, exactly, exactly. And and that data is just available to us as storytellers, as marketers, etc. So, you know, so plugging, plugging that in, so that's part of the process in terms of the world, what, what actually is happening in that world and with those people, um, and that's part of the creative process. So we're, we're using data there. And then actually once the story's developed and the characters develop and the story arcs and, and we know what the music's going to be and, and even if we're casting and directors and, and, and everything else, then um, the model that, you know, that I've created and that we use, it's basically then breaking down every detail of, of that story that story universe and those characters, and identifying what the points, the different points of interest of any audience member, how they can connect to the material, whether it's music, 
whether it's the talent, whether it's the subject matter, you know, it, it could be conspiracy, et cetera. And then from there, identifying, okay, so where is the audience that actually connects to those different types of points of interest? And then creating additional content, because we're multi-platform content creators, additional content that can be distributed in social media, it could be a comic book, it could be a live experience, that, that the audience that I had identified based on the points of interest, that they can find the content. So, um, so, it, so it's a lot of different kinds of data models that we're putting all of our projects through, whether it's uh, uh, story-based content that we create for our clients and also original IP for our company. Like, are you guys, are you guys, <laughs> I actually don't know, like with the systems, like with the systems, do you have like, do you hack into the IP of social channels? No, not hack it, but like is it about scraping social? Is it about Nielsen ratings? Is it a mashup of everything? How, how does it work? How does the system analyze without giving away? Well, which thing we're talking about tax system. Well, well, so or, either, yeah, I, anyone, I don't, anyone. like, we just mess well, around. You guys are talking about, like, just hurt hashtag yeah, searching yeah. and things like that, and, and I don't know if your system's a little bit more than that, but I'm, I'm fascinated to just listen to you guys speak because I'm wondering how you guys are actually making movies or, or content from the start. Like, are you telling me that you're actually seeing an opportunity for a show about yellow, high heel shoes, and then you're hiring a writer to write a show about yellow, high heel shoes? Um, or, because that's pretty backwards from how traditional movie making is made, um, or any kind of storytelling is actually made. Uh, so I'm kind of like fascinated as I'm listening to this because that's pretty uh, unique. I mean, I understand there's opportunities out there for sure, and I love the idea that we're talking about, and I want to hear more of your perspective on this too, because you're looking at audiences as well and then delivering stories for them. You're very specific. You know, one of the things that I like to look at is the idea of Okay, we hear all the time the over 55 audience is very underserved in the film world. Great. And every once in a while, and I'll see when my dreams comes out, or, or another movie comes out really plays that audience and goes for week after week after week. Um, and that's the studio took a chance on buying that movie and actually releasing that movie and putting the economic model together to say, can I make some money on this movie? Um, but they didn't come out and say, wow, 55 plus year olds, um, they're really worried about what's going to happen when everybody around them goes away. And let's make a movie about that. It's just interesting kind of I mean, points. I, the movie's better than I just described it, by the way. Where I'm interested, in, like if 55, I'd want to go and like make a show for 55-year-old women who are single who live in motor homes. In like that's um, well, in a sense, actually, it, like actually, yes, I bet you there is a massive but very targeted market. And so this is the thing. It's like. It's like fishing in a sense. Now I'm talking on a, a very specific and maybe slightly smaller scale, but you can make a, a you can make a sports film, or you can make a film about, and not just about ultimate frisbee. I'd even go and identify um, who, what, when, where, what frisbee golf. But I, I guess I use this example. We run a whole YouTube channel called Verve Girl, which is for 24 year old women who don't need boyfriends, and and. But but we every show we make. Who's on that channel? <laughs> and, uh, I see well, you. Right you're the largest youth channel in Canada. We're bigger than Much Music and MTV combined. We have identified something very specific for women who do not. We say don't need boyfriends. Every show we make is um, quite a, all the female protagonists uh, are about of that age group. None of them define themselves by men in their life. Mm -hmm. So there's many different shows, from a show about so you start people in university you know who are vampire hunters to um, an alternate, alternative wedding show. But in doing that, I think we can go to a very specific group and have a discussion. And to me, this has come from the model of watching the traditional system go out and say like, hey, we're going to make a procedural about firefighters. And, and that, to me, is where the broadcast, I'm speaking of broadcast, not features, that's where this system is mm -hmm. collapsing on itself. The reason HBO and AMC and they're, I would argue they're doing on the broadcast level, Game of Thrones is a show made for 2,000 people, in a sense, of, of right. well, something that, that, that went larger. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I love the idea of what you're talking about, for sure. Um, 
It's interesting if we can transition this a little bit to like more feature film yeah. and Barbara, a bigger film, which I know you do as well, because it's really interesting that there is, you're talking about the VOD model in a sense, is because a lot of times the films are made, they're acquiring films at the festival that weren't made with this model, but can they be marketed with that same model? Can we look at these movies, and I'm sure you're going to talk a little bit about that, can we look at these movies and kind of drill down, almost draw the Venn diagram when we look at this project and say, so what's the kind of, the juicy center? Mm -hmm. Do you call it the juicy center? Or do you yeah, call it something more technical than that? The sweet spot. The sweet spot. We'll go with that. Um, <laughs> when you go into that and then figure out how can you hit them, and is it going to be a traditional theatrical run? Is it going to be a VOD run? Is it going to just go right to, to Amazon Prime or Netflix or something like that? I mean, so, so many things I want to say. But in terms of just even in, in Hollywood, so much material, uh, I'm sorry, content, when it comes to television and, and, and films, um, it's gaming, it, it's, most of it is based on source material. So it's coming from a previous book, it's, it's, coming, it's coming from some other form, for the most part, in terms of what actually most gets... Successful stuff. Well, most of the successful, yes, because, because it already has a built-in audience. So there was data already there, you know, like, I, that was identifying an audience and then creating a movie. Or creating a show, or creating a game, or creating tours. Right, so it, it, exactly. So so Hollywood actually is based on that because it's very risk averse. So they're really looking for these built-in audiences. So it's really it's, for, it's for certain. For 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 certain, and and we you know we see it in television, um, you know traditional television quite a bit, and, and every other show uh, in you know in the states anyway is uh, superhero. I mean, it's, I mean every, everything is superhero. Okay, and, and frisbee apparently, but uh, and golf frisbee now. But uh, <laughs> but um, so you know so 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 that has been used in just historical historically, especially you know again every, a lot of uh, content being created from source material, um, especially in comic books. That's another you know huge one. Doesn't necessarily be super here, but just comic books in, in general, tremendous um, uh, source of, of material. But um, in, you know with the ability that that I have, and, and, and it sounds like. Jay um, is definitely doing as well, and this is and this is um, you know also just what we do in our company because we're also a service company. There are many many uh, clients and networks that will come to us saying, okay, well this is a trend or these are trends that are happening. We want to hit this demographic, etc. What kind of shows can you come up with? Put you some shows that actually cover all this. So absolutely, we're using the same models, and it's and it's coming from. Zeitgeist, it's you know, just topics of interest in from from you know from a body from a potential but how, how do you I know this I don't want to derail you here, but sure. this is the issue that we see like, okay, enough zombie movies already, enough vampire movies already. Like how do you how do you get to the point where it's okay, this is tired? Like how did your firm does your firm have a way of weighing that, okay, um, you know, we weren't ready for another comic book movie or a dark one? Oh absolutely. I mean these discussions really have happened up up front and, and many, many times it's it goes down to educating, educating the client um, in terms of, okay, well, the, 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 you know, it's, it's exactly, you know, the industry um, or, or the, the, the space, if it, if it is zombie, if it's so oversaturated, what would be so different about this? Um, and granted, you know, we would be the one to come up with that, but initially it's like, really, is there enough space for one more zombie television series, it, you know, et cetera. So all of these things have to, I mean, we look at all of these things to, be, to begin with, but, but then once, um, you know, we identify a potential space that can be really exciting coming from a trend. Um, then it's about really being creative and coming up with a great story and characters that tie that in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't want to get to, to it until you have to keep talking, but it's going to be so fascinating because everything you're, you're saying, it sounds so good when we talk about it, but the worst comment you can ever get from an audience on a movie is it's formula. It's predictable. I've seen it before, and we're starting about talking about these things that are coming from those nuggets of that, in a sense. Um, so it's just dangerous how you kind of navigate that. But it's yeah, but it's the creative process. It's yeah. the creative well, that's process what I thought that was yeah, exactly. that makes it different. So. Totally, absolutely. Was there you guys, Mike? You did um, data when you were sort of transferring between the campaign process into creating for beasts, right? How did that work for you? Yes, but I mean. <laughs> It's so, funny it, right? it's so funny listening to this because it's not, it's the epitome of the kind of movie that there is no, I mean it just, it represents, there's no, for that. There's no, there's no uh, like you were saying about Game of Thrones, no one would have, you know, that pitch, or even, no one was talking about six-year-old girls in remote Louisiana 
bayous. You know, it's like you could never have found that stuff. And so that sort of informs how we, completely different, and it gets us to what you were saying. I mean, the way that we come at material is just is completely filmmaker based. So a filmmaker comes to us and says, "This is a this is a film that I want to make. Here's the script that I have." And I don't think that their process has much to do with kind of scraping the internet and seeing what their what was popular. Usually in this sort of independent space where we work, it's a very personal filmmaking. Sometimes there are genre elements, but it's just so detached from from that kind of research. Um, now, but at the same time, it's fun. It's funny because if I had a script that came my way and it came and it was in such a specific world as like ultimate frisbee players who go to the museum. Would change the name of the panel? <laughs> <laughs> but like, if, if it was about such a specific uh, world, that would actually really appeal to me. So that doesn't have anything to do with data in my head. It's just sort of like, as a producer, I'm interested in, in, in helping tell stories that take place in places we've never really been. Um, and it, it so happens that maybe one of those places is something that's actually very, there's a lot of people out there who want to hear about it. But is that from a creative point of view, like I want to tell a story that hasn't been told before, or is yeah. it from I can easily target the people and sell it? No, the, very much the first one. And there's such a disconnect between the first and the second, and I wonder like what, how there could be more of a kind of cross section, because even when I'm trying to get financing for that film, let's say I want to make that film, I don't think that the data about, about that comes into play. I wish it kind of could, mm -hmm. um, and I wish it could be something that I could show to an investor and say, I swear there's a lot of people who are in the middle of it. Oh, I'm here. Yeah, great. I mean, that, but there's, there's, I, I think there's like kind of a, a disparity between, um, you know, somebody who works <coughs> work out an old firehouse in New Orleans and then like, you know, marketing companies and research companies that actually do this stuff and that would be helpful. I don't know, I feel like I'm in a very, very grassrootsy, independent world here, but that we can certainly benefit from that. That wasn't at all what you asked about, but I think that's It's okay. <laughs> Jack, we talked a lot about that as well, about whether or not, um, how do you use the data to inform business decisions, to inform financiers, to inform, you know, to, to get the money coming into you? Yeah, definitely. I think data helps a lot, especially uh, some of our clients use our um, software to convince investors to put money. Uh, factor of film up. Um, it provides evidence and data mm -hmm. to show, right? not just saying, hey, my gut feeling feels right, this is the way to go. Um, also, uh, Which is a constant struggle for creators because as creators, we feel like you know, there is something almost magical and artistic about our process of taste making without yeah, using data. I, I, I agree with that, actually, I respect that. Um, um, nowadays, I found out, you know, that is useful, but 80% of the time, you, you can see this convergence of how the gut feelings of those experienced professionals have the same output of the data produced. Mm -hmm. And, but it's that 20% that data produces is different from them. And I give them, well, does that work? And we can show how the data in the past that worked, right? and, and how that can inform their decisions. Okay. And some of our clients are even using our um, outputs to do um, creative decisions. They're making creative decisions based on our output, which is really amazing to see. And um, we do get that convergence um, of the creative producers saying, well, why didn't we think of that before? And we can show that with data. So. What, what point in the process are you getting involved? Um, we're involved with different stages of different clients. We have been involved with uh, pre-production, mostly. So during that stage, they can, they can make decisions. So is that after a task is already signed on, or is that uh, Here's what we're thinking. No, thinking. before the task is signed up. So it's really early stage. Yeah. And even in raising money? Yeah, even some clients are using the reports to raise money and we can um, create some sort of suggestion list. So here's a list you should cast list to look at where it's a list of things you should do before you look for investment because they will come up. That's a lot. Oh, wait, <laughs> that's for prior sorry. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to actually just continue this conversation for a little bit. Um, really distinguish the, the different kinds of creations um, or, or the, the different kinds of places that you can come at in terms of creative stories. And one, one we're talking about, certainly, and especially for our company, we do have this sort of side where a client will come and they want to meet some objectives. And then it's about, you know, me and us coming up with a really creative idea to incorporate all that if it's organic and seem, seamless so that no one feels, the audience doesn't feel like they're being sold or it's inorganic. It's, it's just hopefully a strong piece of content. 
Um, and then there's the other side of our, of our company where we're creating original IP. And this very much falls in, you know, falls in line with where, where Michael is, where, you know, this, this, is, this is coming from the gut, it's coming from the passion, it's coming from the love, it's coming from an idea that we really, really, really believe in. But once that's developed, then we definitely run it through our model to see what we identify, what the, the potential audience is, because we need that information to sell it. So, so you know, so it basically works both ways, whether you're just starting purely in a creative place with no influence from the outside, and then of course all the influence from the outside, and then you, you're then you're being really creative about telling a story that incorporates that. It's funny. It's almost to my advantage, though, as a producer, now that I'm thinking about it, to have that that data be a little bit obscure and kind of a question mark when I'm talking to financiers, and because it's possible. Yeah, and unless it's possible, maybe yeah. a real producer. Sure, yeah, but I mean, I think it's actually more on, it probably comes into play more for distribution companies than thinking about picking it up, but it's sort of part of my job to convince an investor that this really personal story that happens to take place in this really specific world is worth telling and has universal aspects. I mean, I shouldn't ever say that if I don't believe it to an investor, but it's, that is sort of, otherwise it shouldn't be taken on that movie. If I don't believe in it, I shouldn't. Yeah, and I'm so glad to hear you say that, and I hope everybody thinks like you're thinking, because one of the big dangerous things of all of this is the idea that things will become formulaic, and things right. will come by computer and automation, and, and I love the idea that a director is passionate about a story that has to be told, I mean, we look at the Academy Awards every year, and no computer ever would have said, well, there's a play, play that one. Right. I mean, I mean, maybe, maybe that would have said that, I don't know. <laughs> um, but Whiplash is this great example, it's like, Come on, that movie shouldn't have gotten made based on what we're talking about here, but of course it should have gotten made. Great, that's a unique story. So I love what you're saying, but the other topic that you talked about are really interesting too is the idea of distributors using this data. Um, and that's certainly where we get involved. We might get hired by a studio to take a look at a project and say, tell me who the audience is going to be for this. They're already greenlit the project, but guess what they want to do? They, Transformers wants to bring in, does Paramount. Paramount wants to bring in GM to bring all the cars and Transformers. GM's not going to do that just because it's a movie. They're going to need the data to show why they should do that. So you have all this data to get money into, help with the production, to get promotional partners in, um, and things like that, and understand more marketing too. And I agree, that's when the data really could be helpful for them. Mm -hmm. I, I think this might be a good time to take a look at the slides that you had um, prepared. You're really hyped um, up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, we also want to go into Q&A shortly, so I think we'll, let's take a look at the slides, um, just to frame it. Um, well, actually, you can frame it, but we uh, we took a so we did some predictions about some of the films that are in selection based on a data model. Yes, um, maybe let me just go a little bit over um, how the framework works. Um, if you look at the diagram on the right, um, every data point in the diagram represents a single film, where the marketing spend is measured on the horizontal axis, and uh, the box office is measured on the vertical axis. Um, so if a film is really far off right, it's being spent a lot on marketing, but also it has a great box of success. The green line you see in the graph is uh, the benchmark, where it's generated by taking the average of marketing, uh, average of box office uh, growth uh, of movies with similar marketing spend. So it offers a benchmark that you can compare to. So movies that are above this benchmark are the ones that also other movies can be. And the ones with the lowest benchmark, the ones that are dark, you don't want to make those movies. Um, so, so we we kind of correlate this with the percentage that's based on the graph. You that percentage, the percentage where um, uh, the total data points that's above the line um, showing on the graph put around the movies with data points below. And this one we're seeing is showing almost all performance. Fifty-nine percent over the average, uh, over the benchmark, which reflects yeah, the, which reflects what he's been doing lately, right? It's less consistent performance in the box office. Um, um, no, it's not. It's not with you can adjust the time period. You can say like, oh, it looks like five years, ten years, four years. Right, but I mean by like waiting, it's like Pirates of the Caribbean will like cover like twenty box office. Months. Yeah, we'll get back to uh, to that shortly. Okay. So. If we just look at this, it's it's like you know, so so it's okay. But if we do Johnny Depp and crime drama biography movies, only two data points, but they are both above the line, which means 
hey, this guy's really good and I'm drawing all of you and all you just have shown their interest in this, I can use this challenge afternoon. Um, even though it's only two data points, but it's more likely that all of you still enjoy just seeing him and just having me, which is also the genre that Black Mass is for. Um, if we look at the plot of Black Mass, it's crime drama biography based on true story. And we can see 100% of the movies in the past that that's a crime drama biography which emphasizes some um, true story of all the benchmark. And that shows audience have great interest in seeing this type of movies in the past and it's more likely that Black Mass will follow the same trend. And this is the type of uh, patterns that we, um, that our company does and um, we're obviously very bullish on this movie and we think it will do very well in the box office because they have to send houses odds are in its favor. Um, now we can look at Legend, which is another crime movie, but this one relies more on the thriller um, element. Um, first we can look at Tom Hardy and thrillers. It's really 50-50, it doesn't offer any assurance. I think you have two Tom Hardy. Well, if you have one, it's 50-50. <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, if you look at crime thriller biography movies, even though we only have three data points in the system, only one of them is about the benchmark. It doesn't offer much assurance either. Um, if we take a step, a step back, we look at crime thriller movies based on true story, which is what legend is. Data suggesting the same thing. Only 33% of all those movies in the past are about the benchmark. So we. The legend of that. <laughs> it's most likely not to be as good as Black Mass. <laughs> That's what I would say, but um, data is suggesting that odds are not in his favor, obviously. And, uh, um, it still can't really just succeed 33%, but it's relatively low. Mm -hmm. um, Do you guys think that this is this? Well, can I ask you a question? What did, you, did you model out um, straight out of confidence? No, I didn't do that, but I, I could if I had. I would just wonder what that would, how that would show up. Yeah, uh, actually, I uh, did some study on that. Um, uh, rap music in music genre was showing great percentage by forgot which uh, what, what the exact number is, but rap music in music genre is showing great um, percentage on, on my model. It's going higher. Yeah, it's much higher than 50 50. Um, I, I have a couple of questions. Yes. Um, number one, marketing spending is secret. Mm -hmm. um, so, are you pulling like Nielsen data um, to see points? Are you using media spend, or you actually have PA numbers? PA numbers. We we didn't go for Nielsen because they don't do not release a number um, to people like us. But we do have a higher charge system to ask for this number. Um, on average, we use a training set. To, to, to ask me this number and we came up with a new method that could generate about 90% accuracy on the on average for my Okay, okay. I'll check, we'll check some of your movies after I'll let you know. Because that's a huge thing and I think if you look at any if you look if you plotted just all marketing spending with all movies, you're gonna see that, you know, yeah, line. that's that's, that's why you have line line line. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But number two you should put um, word of mouth into any of these movies because a lot of these movies you're looking at here are are um, are, are rollouts. Um, and you know the release strategy can affect a lot of what's happening. Even though it's probably affected in your market spending, yeah. but how is word of mouth? How is how good a movie is based on that? Because the two things we can look at is these elements that you put together. Not only would they make show you a movie, but you can also then talk about all right, how good is that movie, and how can that actually affect it? Yes, um, as you can see on the last, there's a, there's a word list, a word cloud, as you call it. Mm -hmm. Actually. One of them, it's not showing here, we do have critically acclaimed, okay. which is word of mouth flow, and we tend to explain all the other elements other than marketing spend from the, the word flow on the last one. Um, because from my study, um, marketing spend is one most effective um, way to affect box office. Yeah, not just your study, that's a fact. That's a fact. <laughs> yes. Seeing this, this is going to, if it isn't already, this is a boardroom at 20th Century Fox on Tuesday. <laughs> and like this, this is actually really scary, I think. Uh, to think about, to look at the keywords, like I saw the word beer, airport, female nudity. Like, can't you imagine? I joked before we came in here, one day there would be an Academy Award uh, winning film, and someone would step on stage and said, This was entirely written by a computer. <laughs> And and to me, this is like seeing into the matrix of where that goes. There's a studio out there that already says they do this exact same thing. 
Uh, there is, and we and look at the crap that we get every summer that we complain about. Apparently, the system is telling us this is what we want. I see us as the audience actually almost in a way rejecting that. I, I, I think, I bet you the system told us we wanted Fantastic Four, even something like the Avengers and the Marvel. Well, I think you push Fantastic Four into this, and I think you'd have to be off the charts. I think you'd have to have an awful movie, um, The Rock. No. But, but I mean, that's, <laughs> that is the... You know, it is um, it is a slippery slope. I think this is a fascinating thing to look at. I also wonder where I'm coming at it from the low budget independent features. You, you don't have the name. How does that, just where this goes in future in the in the great divide of content creation, it's fascinating and it's useful, but it's a, it's a scary glimpse into it. And yeah. I think that's one of the things that it's definitely a balance that we need to be able to to navigate and to manage. And there's a constant struggle between duty as a as a creator, duty to your service providers, whether or not we are creating mindless puppets with this type of information, or if it can be used to assist in making decisions that mitigate risk or that are able to identify audiences to ensure monetization and critical acclaim is that yeah i got the mantra right um yeah so i think it's i, I feel like we're running out of time a little bit yeah so i man i, I this panel could go on forever could we can we all just go have lunch afterwards or something like let's go for drinks or something like that but um why don't let's open it up to the audience for a little bit um <laughs> <laughs> Let's open up to the audience. Um, I'm going to if the our mic runners are positioned. All right, I'll take a uh, question over here. Check, check. Thank you. Um, when you talk about big data in general, uh, when it really works well, like what the case with the long campaign in 2012, uh, we celebrated it. It's such a great thing. Let's copy the models and suits every single time. But then when it fails. Um, Steven Soderbergh had a state of the industry speech in San Francisco Film Festival two years ago. He was complaining, not complaining, talking about how they did all the matrix and all the analysis on side effects and how it just failed completely to predict. They might as well could have just guessed. So my question would be, when big data fails, how do you adjust your models? What do you do? How do you learn from this? Thank you. I love that question. <laughs> <laughs> insights from the past experience. That's how we people learn. I think that's what we call it machine learning, because they learn from the past. Um, there's really no perfect way of doing this, but if we can do it on some level, 80 to 90 percent, it still works, right? If there's 10 percent of the chance we fail, um, and we end up putting that data back to the system and adjust our system, then we're enhancing the model while um, maybe seeing other aspects we're not seeing. Do you do you count for randomness in your model? Yeah, we, we that's why we have the percentage sign yeah. there. It's not go or not go, it's the percentage, right? right. So there's a randomness introduced in the model. Right. I'll ask you, I'm just curious if there's um, if, if you have any way in entering the emotional journey or the, the or the emotional connection that the audience can make with the content. Because that's, I think that's at the beginning, the middle, the end of the day, that's really the driver. You know, people need to connect with a story or a character. Yeah, in fact, we're actually working on that right now. Um, it's something called natural language processing. We can um, tell the sentiment of the audience in comments. Stuff like that. Um, sorry, um, I guess my question feeds off of the first question here. So, with big data, we're working with present and past information, but I'm wondering if in your modeling and your algorithms, there's any uh, predictive uh, ongoings there. So, for example, the superhero, or, uh, superhero bubble is going right now, but eventually that bubble is going to burst. So, as a contextual example, I'm wondering if there's anything in your programming that would allow you to foresee when that might happen. Um, it, it, it's, it is very interesting to look at that, and as you mentioned, the superhero genre, the system's not, uh, I don't know the exact number in my head, but um, it's not showing very super, super high percentages. Even if you only look at Marvel, it's not showing very high uh, percentages. 
because of Compass for marketing stuff, you could spend a lot of money in marketing if you only need a box office. It's huge, but if you come from marketing, it's not that big. Um, and you can draw some insights through that thing. Hey, what are the elements that push the superhero movie above that? What are the elements that pull it down from that? So um, I think um, to tell if this movie, this genre will explode or not, you should also look at other aspects, not just looking at superhero. Because if it dies out, and because people didn't realize they're not hitting the ones that people want to see in superhero, other elements in the superhero movie that people want to see are focusing on the unknown or the lower aspects of that. Um, it's, it's not a very good indicator of how the genre is. Yeah, I, I think that's an interesting uh, point. And I, I think my answer is anybody that says yes to that is lying. Because I don't think we know the answer to that. I mean, you look at the stock market from a couple of weeks ago and that tank. Nobody sold everything on Friday, so Monday they came in and took all the losses or shorted everything. But after the fact, oh, everybody saw the writing that was on the wall, and we knew that the correction was in line. And I think that's something that we do a lot in the film industry: is we are smarter after the fact. Um, and I think the answer is that we don't know. Well, that's why these hundred million dollar movies are getting green lit. Um, you know, because we do think everything is going to keep going up and up and up and up. Uh, but it's an interesting point. The first one that can tell you when that is up. If you type my mind anew, um, it's, it's good. It's going to be, that'll be worth it. But I think we have time for one more question. One more question on this side. Oh, okay. Um, there goes the time. <laughs> oh, John? Okay, sorry. Um, there's a lot of talk about the pre, the, the statistics for pre-production. So we're going to be talking a little bit more about in the marketing side of things because obviously, you know, you'll, a lot of people will make the film. The filmmakers will have a certain audience that they have in mind, and then the distributors and stuff will have a different idea. And I think a good example, for example, is Straight Outta Compton. Uh, when I've told people about, I really love that movie, but I, I tell people about, oh, you should see it. And they're like, oh, I don't really like rap music. It's like no, no, no. It's a, it's, and, and I think the strength of that movie is that it's really about um, just about getting out of, out of uh, you know, social class and getting in and racial discrimination and like that. And a lot of really interesting topics that are a bit more universal than if you like NWA or not. So, um, so I was just wondering like how much of that the, the, that goes into the process. Like you get brought in when a film is delivered. And we're talking about okay, how we're going to market it. Do we do you look at those kinds of tools about how you actually putting the marketing plan together? Yeah, I mean, I could take this because this is what we do, and we're going to be doing the panel on Sunday. What time? Yeah, um, one. One something. Yeah. That's all we know. And that's going to be on that topic. So come on by. Um, but a quick sneak preview of that is, I mean, that's what we do. Is the idea that I love compliments as an example, um, and Whiplash is another good example, and that you just described word of mouth. Um, and a bottle is some of these movies are so hard to get past it being a movie about rap music. Southpaw is a movie about boxing. Whiplash is a movie about drumming. But then you see these movies that about so much more than that. So a big job that we have is we show movies to audiences well before they come out. And we understand what themes they're responding to. We then go ahead and test materials, test trailers, and put data points behind who's the most likely people to want to see this movie in the first week, who's the most likely people to want to see this movie in the fourth week after they hear exactly what you just said. And then we work very close with distributors. And, and I used to run marketing at Weinstein, and, and we're the, we were the, I mean, we, you know, back at Miramax, we defined our rollout platform model. Um, and I was doing exactly that at what time, not to release the monster, but I said it is time in. Um, at what point is the right time to release the movie in the marketplace? Because a company is an unusual example. But when you look at a whiplash, if that movie opened in Kansas City the same day it went to New York and LA, it would have died. No chance. But kind of learning those learnings that we have about um, the themes and how they can get out in front before the movie catches up to that in that marketplace is really helpful. So there is a lot of data. We'll get into it more on Sunday. And this, I just want to add, just in terms of um, Compton, is that that script and that effort and that team, uh, I mean, it, it took like at least a, it took like 10 years to actually make that film. Uh, it went through so many studios. It was it was optioned several times. Several times. I mean, it, it was just an incredible history just for that particular movie to get made. But what happened was the demographic changed, not only in the U.S. but just even globally, and that's what supported the film now. So that's something else to really look at. Really, uh, you know. The, the depth and the level of the demographic of your particular yeah, project. Mark, other movies in the same kind of thing that just expand outside of that. Sorry. 
And I think with that we are out of time, but what I will do is I will ask the speakers who, if you do have some time, if you could be in the filmmaker's lounge immediately afterwards, I think there probably are more questions to be asked if you have some time after the session. But if you can just, so we have on our panel, we have Jack Dang, we have Jay Bennett, Yvette Vargas, Gary Faber, and Michael Gottwald. If you can all just please give them a round of applause.